Aloha. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a new talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Brought to you by Think Tank Hawaii and Kingsfield Law Office. We invite renowned immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and the contributions to cultural diversity. Today's guest is our good friend, Rob Hafez. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Sean. I'm so glad to, be, to have you here. We have known each other for decades. Oh my gosh, and I'm yeah. gonna, yes. <laughs> I'm going to uh, read a short bio of you, if you don't mind, then I have plenty of questions for you. So Rob is a pre vice president and co-owner of Federal Publication Seminars, IPS. He is responsible for recruiting and managing strategic partnerships and alliance with government contractor executives and associations, attorney organizations, law faculty, and the media. Rob has over 30 years of experience working with several national legal publishing entities, including Thomson Reuters and American Lawyer Media. He has successfully designed business development, marketing, and a sales program for the ground up and led the programs to a successful launch. Rob excels in forming mutually beneficial relationships. He has deep connection with C-level and marketing executives in government contracting, global technology, and technology-enabled companies. He also enjoys mentoring individuals who are new to the field of government contracting and events management. Thank you so much for the, taking time to be on the show, Rob. We, as I said, we know each other for decades, and but until like two or three years later, we first met at West Publishing, you now Thomson Reuters, I realized actually you are second generation immigrant. So basically means you were born in the United States, but your parents were born outside the United States. So my first question to you is what brought your family to the United States and settled in the state of Minnesota? Really, Chang, it was actually, it, it's probably a similar story to, to a lot of the immigrants that, that you've talked to. It's, it was opportunity. Um, my, and, it, and it actually were my grandparents that, that came over, um, mm -hmm. not my parents, just to, just to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, and lucky enough, because anyone that knows the history of the Middle East, and especially Lebanon, oh, yeah. uh, there's been a lot of war. Um, throughout the decades, throughout the centuries, actually. And luckily, it wasn't for reasons of war that my grandparents came here. Both my grandfathers came in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. One of them came through um, Ellis Island. The other did not have the paperwork to come through Ellis Island. So I actually made his way through um, Canada and came to oh. Minnesota. But both had heard of a burgeoning Middle Eastern Lebanese specifically community um, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, no relatives, I believe at the time that they came here were here, but mm -hmm. friends of relatives had directed them to St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, luckily both grandparents <laughs> ended up, you know, around the same part of St. Paul um, together and met, and that is where my parents met. Um, mm -hmm. Once both their fathers uh, in church, of course, which was a, probably a common thing uh, back in those days. Uh, but, but both came here for opportunities, completely different backgrounds. One grandfather was educated at the American University in Beirut and came here as an accountant and had a job working for Armors Meats. The other grandfather came here um, with not much schooling uh, worked as a cobbler when he first came to St. Paul, and then through various relationships that he formed, um, got into the service industry as far as bars, restaurants, etc. And that's where he made his living. And um, so it came from different backgrounds, 
but all into this one area of St. Paul, Minnesota, happened to both be um, part of the same, grew up in the same faith and, and met in the, in the same church. Oh, what a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. And you are most uh, the, the most hardworking people I ever know. And uh, I, I trust that your grandparents are very hardworking people. But I'm a little bit just surprised, pleasantly surprised, nevertheless, to learn that there are quite a large Lebanese American community in the state of Minnesota. And I, I just realized that because I, I live like three miles from uh, Lebanon Hills Park. Yes. And is that the park and something related to the Lebanon community? It, I actually, I don't know, but I do think it's very interesting that um, I have grown up and worked within this probably six mile radius for 55 years. Mm -hmm. And that has been there. And I, I don't know the history of it. I'm sorry to say that. No but, worry about it. So I but, there it is, but, but you're right. There is a community here, um, Middle Eastern, Lebanese, Syrian. Um, the church that I go to is, they actually used to call it a Syrian Orthodox, but it's actually, mm. we call it an Eastern Orthodox church. Um, so the Lebanese Syrian community has been a, a part of this community, the same, really the St. Paul community that I grew up in for over a hundred years. And I think that that's very interesting. So there's a lot of history, um, both uh, economically, religiously, et cetera. It's absolutely amazing to, to you know, the, the people outside Minnesota, state of Minnesota can hardly imagine that we have a very strong Lebanese Syrian community, Somali community, Tibetan community, Hmong community, it's absolutely just yep. amazing for the in the middle of the heartland of the United States. But now I'm asking you, since you have a pretty strong cultural background, and even you are not the first generation immigrant, per, and but I want to ask you what what is was it like when you grew up in the state of Minnesota, in the center of the Midwest, mm -hmm. but you do have a strong cultural background of your family. And what language did you speak when you grew up? Only English? It, it really was English. There was a little bit of Arabic spoken when we went to uh, my grandparents' house. Unfortunately, I never got to meet my father's parents, my father's mm -hmm. mother or father. Um, mother passed away before I was born, well before I was born, and my grandfather passed away very close to, to when I was born. Uh, but I was able to luckily have a have a long relationship with um, my grandmother and grandfather Awada, mm -hmm. and um, it, that's when when we would go to their home, whether it was a Sunday dinner or um, or sometimes to the lake with them in in the summer. Uh, that's when you would you would my grandfather spoke very broken English, so there was a lot of Arabic speaking going on, mm -hmm. a lot of Arabic speaking between him and my grandmother. Um, my mother did not really understand Arabic that well, even though it was spoken in the home when she was growing up, but my father did. And so there were times when he would translate a few things to me. And um, most of the things I picked up, though, as a child were probably, well, definitely food items, um, how to pronounce those, but unfortunately, some swear words as well. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and, uh, did you identify culturally uh, Feel, oh, oh, did you feel strongly, you know, affiliated with the uh, Lebanese Assyrian community, or you just feel like a regular, you know, kid in, in the uh, state of Minnesota? I, you know, when you grow up in the house that we did, and in uh, going to the schools that we did, um, yeah, I was probably one of the, maybe there was one or two other um, Lebanese or Middle Eastern in friends that were, you know, in my elementary class and then on into junior high, et cetera. We were Lebanese and we were, we, I was very proud of it. And, um, and there were differences Absolutely. and there were differences that I had to deal with. It was never an issue for me from a negative standpoint. It was always something that was just different. And I was never made to feel, um, uh, anything other than proud about it, even though all of my friends, for example, in 
I went to the public schools through elementary and through junior high, but then went to a Catholic school, even though I'm not Catholic. And my religion was different. My Eastern Orthodox, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. the biggest difference was around Easter time. Everyone, we always had a different Easter. We followed a different calendar than the, than the Catholic church. So our Easter's were always um, from one to six weeks apart. And then every six years, they would be the same. Oh, and so I would always have to deal with that. Everyone was getting off of school for Easter throughout my entire life, throughout my, my schooling, whether it was, you know, early, early elementary or, or through high school. Yeah. Um, everyone had Easter break, Easter vacation, the Monday after Easter off. And that was great. But but only every other every six years did that mean something to me, you know, where oh. it was actually where I was getting off when everyone else got off for, for the holiday. And so it would always be sometimes a source of jokes and things like that, but never, ever made to feel um, embarrassed about it or anything like that. And, and that was good. I was always proud of it and still am and still celebrate mm -hmm. my Easter, even though my children were brought up in the Catholic faith. Um, it was just one particular holiday where we got to celebrate two, two times, which is always fun. Um, and then there were different traditions around, around Christmas. Um, mm -hmm. Most, uh, again, growing up around Catholics, um, they had midnight mass at Christmas time. We always had mid midnight mass at Christmas time and at Easter time. Easter was always mm -hmm. the biggest celebration in the Eastern Orthodox Church. That way. Not not more than more than Christmas, but held probably as equal to Christmas. And so I was always running out to go to midnight mass, you know, in the spring uh, for our, our Easter or our Good Friday mass as well. And, you know, that took away from some of the things that my friends were doing because the Catholic Church didn't have any of those particular types of masses, um, a, a midnight mass on the Saturday before um, or a, a very, our, our Good Friday Mass is one of the most beautiful Masses that you could attend. And, and I haven't been, I've been to a lot of Catholic Masses, but I, I don't remember going to a Good Friday Mass that could compare to the Eastern Orthodox Mass. Beautiful. Thank you so much. That's very mm -hmm. educational. I learned a lot from what I just heard from you. And I can tell you when I grew up in the 1980s in China, Lebanon was on the TV every day. And because of the conflict between Lebanon and uh, Israel. And when I hear Lebanon, my first impression from my memory is a good, good people. <laughs> because mm. on Chinese TV, Lebanon was the right side. Israel was in, on the wrong side. That is very clear. I'd be, I'd be educated that way and that is still, well, now obviously I don't, you know, think that when I hear the word Israel, not automatically going to be a negative, but yep. Lebanon is positive. That can be deeply, deeply embedded in my, you know, uh, gene. But let's, you know, you mentioned your family, and I I think I knew your family pretty well. I mm -hmm. love the kids. I had, a, you hosted the best party ever. I enjoyed many different fantastic food you offered. And we go to Dinsen restaurant all the time. Yeah. So yes. obviously you are not a typical, typical Minnesotan, I would say, because of some Minnesotan, typical, typical Minnesotan, they, they are hesitant to try different ethnic yes. food. But you are very adventurous in trying the different food, including Dinsen, the typical Cantonese food. Yeah. And... Tell us a little bit about your family and your career. Even I think I know some of them, but uh, could you just give us a brief, you know, overview of your your personal history and your career history? Sure, sure. Um, well, I guess maybe to start at the beginning, I, I was born and raised here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Really have have again been in this ten. I guess a 10 mile radius from downtown St. Paul, which was called the flats of St. Paul at that time, um, where they brought me home to as a baby, uh, moving up the hill to um, West St. Paul, Minnesota, 
and then um, to to Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. Th those were the years that I was with my my parents, and and that was through 1980, probably 87 or 88, when um, I went to St. Thomas Academy for high school and um, a, a Catholic school, Catholic military school, and then went on to, at the time, the College of St. Thomas. It's now the University of St. Thomas for my four years. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I graduated in 1989 from the University of St. Thomas, uh, that's when I moved out of my home in Invergrove Heights and moved to Egan, Minnesota and went to work for West Publishing and um, was with West from really from 89 to 2000. And then from 2000 to 2010 with American Lawyer Media, mm -hmm. and then luckily came back to what was now, instead of um, West Publishing, was now Thomson Reuters, oh. and moved back there to, in 2010 to 2014, and, and, and then uh, bought this business and, and so on. So um, was very lucky to, I think, grow up in an area that you have you didn't say it, but in, it really is kind of a melting pot. All the different, whether it's Hmong or Somali or uh, middle, you know, the Middle Eastern, the the, the Lebanese, the Greeks. Um, you know, when you grow up in that type of an area, you want to try different things. Um, my father was always trying different foods. Um, loved spicy foods. Was you know took that always to the limit of trying the spiciest foods you could find. Um, I remember coming home one time and seeing in the sink uh, calf hearts or calf livers, uh, calf hearts. Uh, I mean, a pile of them that would have made anyone sick. Now, I didn't try them, but that was kind of an annual thing that he and I think four or five of his friends would get together. They would grill these and they would eat them with our, our garlic sauce, which I believe you've had. Um, John, yeah. uh, our, our very potent garlic sauce and onions. And, um, but, you know, it was memories of seeing my father and my mother eat a lot of different foods, experience a lot of different um, cultural things, whether it was at the Festival of Nations, which I'm not even sure if we still do a Festival of Nations in St. Paul, but for at least 30 years, um, that was a big celebration every year. Something that I personally was involved with from our church, always having a booth there as a child, um, to actually chairing our church's presence at it, and loved it, loved going to all the different booths. They probably had about 75 different booths from um, all over the world. Um, again, these people all living here in the Twin Cities. So I'm, I really feel lucky, even though I'm not as traveled, as someone like you, Chong, um, I really haven't left the United States other than, you know, Mexico, Canada, and, and a few other, um, you know, Car Caribbean islands. I really feel lucky that I've grown up here to experience a lot of that stuff. And I'm still relatively young. Hopefully I'll get overseas and get to Lebanon. I've, I've never visited Lebanon. My children would love to go there. Um, so uh, again, I, I, that's a little bit of my history. I didn't go much into the work and I can do that. Um, mm -hmm. if you want me to go into more, you know, what, because I know some of this is going to be about maybe attorney training and, and things. Yeah. Um, but, but that's kind of from a personal family standpoint. Um, you know, my, my entire life's been in this 10 mile melting pot, um, kind of a 10 mile radius. Thank you so much. But I do mm -hmm. want a quick comment. You mentioned that I'm uh, I traveled uh, a mm -hmm. little bit more than you do, but you are a global thinker as well. You you have a global mindset, and uh, you know, no matter <laughs> it doesn't matter how many how many countries you have traveled, people can yep. still can be very close minded if they don't see and don't feel, and and. It's amazing you call our state a melting pot. I think that out-of-staters will be surprised to hear that, but I couldn't agree with you more. And Minnesota is unique, and it's an open-minded and a place extremely culturally diverse and tolerant. That's the most important thing for yep. all of us to understand you know, the Minnesota. We have a very high degree of empathy toward other human beings. 
Anyway, now we need to uh, uh, change the subject to a little bit of serious topic like uh, uh, career. And you, I remember, I vividly remember the day you bought federal public health seminars. And, uh, you know, our friends are, and including myself, are so excited for you. But uh, we had uh, this question, and uh, that will be a tough job. But a few years later, you did an amazing job and you grow the, and you and your colleagues grow the company to a size that was quite unthinkable when, and, uh, when it was just a, a department, yeah. a big corporation. Now it's a fully independent, it's a leader in government contracting, training, it's uh, got a superb reputation as offer a very full range of courses through so federal contractors, lawyers, and uh, all legal professionals. And we don't have a lot of time to go through your full uh, curriculum, but I, I'm, I'm always amazed to, to visit your website to understand what you are uh, gonna keep up to date of the development of the law and the regulations. But just a quick question: How do you feel when you work with you know lawyers and uh, all these legal professionals? You, you yourself are not uh, a lawyer; no. you are a business leader and executive. But you basically have been working most with lawyers. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it is pretty. <laughs> Of course, as the, the lead up to to this this interview, you think about this stuff, and it is ironic. Yeah. But 1989, I started at what was then West Publishing, and and to my to this day, my entire career. So what is that? 89, 30, 36 years, well, um, or right, 36 years mm -hmm. uh, has or no 30, yeah, 36 years has been devoted to. The attorney, the the world of, of law, in in different facets. My first three or four years really was was more on the production side of of all the tools that attorneys use, um, the books. I was involved more in the printing and and the shipping of of all of the, you know, the the books that West Publishing um, published and 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 produced. But also very early on when I got into marketing, I was involved with at the time CD-ROM and five and a quarter inch discs yeah. and three and a half inch discs and getting those out to law students so that they would learn about Westlaw. So you can say really from 1992 on, I have been involved in the training in one way or the other of attorneys. And it is funny, I, 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 would, I do wanna mention Andy King, my business partner, when he and I bought the company in 2014, we kind of had, his background was more in the actual selling of training to mm -hmm. not necessarily attorneys. That was more the, the, the end of his career before federal publication seminars, but he was involved in all different kinds of training through all different kinds of industries. But we were together for about the last 10 years before we bought federal publications and and at Thomson Reuters at the time. And it, it's just interesting, the, the things that we learn, you ask what it's like and what it is day to day, do you training attorneys? It's a much different world. And Andy would tell you this right away. Um, everything in the attorney world and training is light years behind. Mm -hmm. and, and I think present company excluded, I, I think technology, scares attorneys and especially the older attorneys. I think we're seeing a, a change over that's been going on for probably a couple decades in, in the legal industry. And I think it's starting to catch up a little bit, but when you look at other industries, um, we're light years behind in terms of how we train attorneys. Um, when we bought federal publication seminars in 2014, nothing online, maybe two or three, maybe a half a dozen webinars. 60 minute webinars. Now we're, we're doing, um, we have a calendar of probably over 300 webinars and training courses, full length training courses that last over five days um, are done virtually. Now, some of that was assisted, how quick we did it was assisted because of um, COVID and people mm -hmm. not being able to come to a public classroom setting. 
but it really has sped things up over the last two to three years um, based on what we've all faced. So uh, my initial response to what it is like, it's, um, it, it's frustrating at times because there's a lot of things that we might want to do that the legal industry isn't necessarily ready for. Thank you very much. I, I totally agree. And I think the reason you and Andy are doing so well with your colleagues at the Federal Public Year Seminars, because you are, I feel like you are working harder than lawyers. You are <laughs> super Well, I don't know about that. Well, uh, to be honest, I, I had the great honor and the privilege to be on your faculty a few times and giving uh, webinars. And every every people I worked with on your team is super f- professional, super attentive, and everything just run like a clock and always punctuate, always right. There's uh, no surprise, and I thoroughly enjoy it. And I wish you all the best with your team and uh, federal co- public seminars. And uh, it, it, it's just a great company. You're, you're, are, you know. Uh, I appreciate that, Chong. So, in a, if I have a second, in addition to Andy, I really you you bring up a good point. We we have had anywhere over the last eight years, at any given time, we have eleven to fifteen employees. Wow. Yep. The growth of this company and the success that we've had is not just Andy and me. It's it's in all of them. Whether it's people who have just started or people who have been here um, longer than us owning it. Uh, we, we brought over some legacy employees with us when we, mm-hmm. when we bought it from Thomson Reuters. The one thing that Andy and I think about every time we're doing anything, this company is over 65 years old. So it has a rich mm-hmm. history in, in educating uh, attorneys, educating companies who do business with the government. Um, we take that very seriously. We have the coat of arms that was um, that that was developed back 65 years ago when this company became a company, when it became federal federal publications. We have it here on the wall, and it's a reminder to us of something very serious. We take it very serious. I mean, these are companies who are doing business with our government. Sometimes it's international and dealing with other countries, mm-hmm. and um, we help them to stay compliant and. and 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 follow the law. So Absolutely. we're we're very happy and excited about it. Well, thank you for your uh, hard work to ensure that uh, the federal contractors are completely up to date to the to the law and the regulations. We are running out of time, but I do have a question I want to ask. Sure. That we ask all our distinguished guests, and you have millennials in your household. And you just imagine time travel permitted. You are traveled back to you 30 years and ago and met a younger you okay. at, at your kid's age. And yeah. what would you want to say to your a younger self of you? Well, I would if I were in my 20s, so you know, one of the <laughs> It's interesting because I look at the millennials um, and I have two of them. I have three children. Two would be considered millennials. One would be, one is younger than that. I don't know. Is that the Gen Gen X? Gen or Z. Gen, Gen, Z. Gen Z. Yes. Okay. So the millennial, I would, you know, so my, <laughs> the advice I give my, those millennials who are in their twenties or really all of them is to communicate more. So I, I was different. I would say to me, slow down. There was no rush in doing a lot of the things that I wanted to do right out of college. Slow down, enjoy, enjoy the things that I wanted to do. And, and, and don't ask me what those were because I don't even know that I could tell, tell you that. But what I see in, in some of these millennials is they have slowed down. Now this is a, this is a positive and a negative Mm -hmm. as an employer of some of these millennials It's hard because they don't communicate like we communicate. They're not used to being in an office setting like we're used to being in an office setting every day. And I hear this from other owners of companies from from whether it's restaurants or whether it's accounting firms, large um, top six CPA firms. It's a different world when you get these 20 year olds working for you. They don't want to pick the phone up. They're used to texting. They're used to sending emails. They don't want to just pick up the phone and talk to someone when it could take five minutes to solve a problem rather than sending 
20 texts or five emails back and forth. So that would be my advice to the ones that are there now. For me, I would have wanted to take a page from the millennials now Mm -hmm. to have slowed my life down a little bit, but still kept the communication skills that I have, Mm -hmm. that I had then and I have now. And I am doing the job of teaching my three children who are at dif- differing ages, of course. They're all within about 12, 12 years apart. I'm trying to teach them, and they're going to probably see this when this airs. I'm trying to teach them as much as possible to communicate. And that could mean anything. It could mean with friends. It could mean with your boss. It could mean with, your, um, with whoever your partner is. More communication and in-person communication is is worth it. Fantastic. Rob, thank you so much. A good advice. Good mentor, good father, good boss, and good friend. Wow. Kids are lucky to have you. Your employee are lucky to have you as boss. The young professionals are lucky to have you as a mentor, and we are lucky to have you as a friend. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this, Chong. I appreciate it, and um, I'll look forward to seeing it. Yes, it will be uh, broadcast uh, shortly. Okay. Thank you again for your time and look forward to having you back on the show and let's continue our discussion. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.